So we're, we're live now and it's uh, 3 p.m. sharp and I'd like to welcome you all to the second of our series two um, webinars on um, a range of topics from life science, technology, um, venture funding and some, some broader subjects too um, as we like to explore in O2H given the things that we're involved in and I think it's worth mentioning I've got a huge uh, uh, passion for architecture design and interiors as, as all of you know I, I love um, indulging um, in, in these uh, subjects but the, the true interest is um, we believe that in O2H and I'm sure a lot of other people do too that the culture of your organization um, and your institute or um, company is crucial to future success um, of that organization um, and how you engage with the people, what your customers think of you, how happy people are, um, how people relate to each other. So the culture of your organization is absolutely crucial. And one of the elements of that culture is the environment uh, that you create um, in terms of your values, your processes, but also in terms of the design of the, the infrastructure, the architecture, the spaces. Um, so that kind of Got us thinking, really, in terms of why don't we get uh, some, um, some 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 people who've done some brilliant work in in, 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 in in the field of architecture and created some really incredible and interesting workplaces, or companies, or institutions, or organisations, and how you can use um, the tools that all of you are very skilled in to create um, an, an amazing culture. Um, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into that zone. Um, and we're also doing a couple of buildings ourselves. One is in India, um, a research center there. We're also renovating a, um, a heritage uh, um, site in, in Cambridge. So all of these uh, um, discussions are, are, are very relevant to us in terms of what we're doing, because we're really keen to build that culture and, and to build that um, identity uh, for O2H. So it'd be, um, I'm sure, like us, a lot of other people will be interested to, to hear your views on the matter. So without further to do, um, it is a chai time. And, uh, but I've obviously in this weather of 35 degrees, I've given myself an iced uh, chai today. I hope you, I don't know what the weather's like for you at Paneet in, in, in Boston, but um, uh, it's beautifully, beautifully warm today in, in, in England anyway. So uh, this is my uh, chai time of, of choice. It's for being resolutely British. I've got a <laughs> tea yeah. and sugar in it. So. Perfect. Hugh, um, is it's it cold beer? Warm, <laughs> Good. Melody, okay. your choice of beverage? I have my sparkling water to match my white background. <laughs> Perfect. And <laughs> uh, I'm having some water. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, oh, very good. All right, so if you'd like to um, introduce yourselves um, briefly, we'll, um, we'll, we'll start with that. Uh, Melody, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, my name is Melody Leong. I'm a senior associate at Zahadid Architects. I've been there for over 15 years working really closely with Zaha and Patrick and um, focusing over those years over a number of different scale projects. So working across fashion, product, installation, exhibition design, interiors, and architecture. Um, right now we're actually working on two very uh, forward-looking client clients' workspaces in China, one in Hong Kong and one in Guangzhou. And um, I also oversee the gallery, which is in Clerkenwell, which Prashant has been to. So hopefully we'll be able to open again soon and meet some of you there. Brilliant. Look forward to that. And um, thank you for all the uh, invites to your wonderful exhibitions. Um, Hugh? Yeah, I'm uh, Hugh Williams. I'm a director, one of three directors of a company called Force Space, based in um, East London. Um, we specialised predominantly in residential mixed use kind of uh, projects or you know private residential. Um, one of the things we're working on is obviously your job Prashant up in uh, Cambridge um, and we run the Negroni Talks which um, have de developed and gained a bit of momentum um, in conjunction with our uh, restaurant Umbra um, over the last two years so yeah a bit of a mixed bag. Thank you very much. And um, Puneet, would you like to, um, a full disclosure here, uh, Puneet has, uh, I've been twice over to the USA and been on his uh, lab design course. So I'm, I'm one of his uh, students, um, <laughs> uh, so to speak. But uh, yeah, thank you for, the, for those courses. They were absolutely amazing. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to speak uh, with 
with great people here on the call. Uh, I am Puneet Jain. Uh, I'm an architect with Canon Design. Uh, we are an international design firm. Uh, I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I have been with the firm for almost 29 years now. And of those 29 years, uh, in the last 20, I have focused on uh, science and technology practice at the firm in conjunction with sustainability. So I uh, truly believe uh, the influence of sustainable design as it relates to science buildings uh, and uh, in turn, how it creates a culture for the organizations uh, that believe in sustainability. So my focus is in that area and I uh, volunteer on a number of uh, national and international organizations uh, to promote that idea in that field. Thank you. Um, uh, Sasha, we, we first met through our, my curiosity for the iconic uh, Shoreditch House. Um, so please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sasha Gabler. I'm a founder and um, partner in Gabler Tooth Architects. We've been going a surprisingly long time, actually. We were just children when we started. And um, we, we do a broad range of work covering um, aviation, hospitality, residential, um, some commercial buildings, quite a lot of mixed use stuff, a lot of work with listed buildings and um, repurposing buildings is something we're very interested in. And how you don't have a rigid style, you respond to the place and you know, how you make the old sit with the new. So they talk to each other and create something like shortage maybe, that when people go to, they get more than just the nuts and bolts that the lift came out at the right floor they actually get an emotional response that makes them possibly a little bit cheered up. Um, and that's, you know, I suppose it may sound a little bit facile, but it isn't that the purpose of good architecture must actually add something emotional to people's response. Um, and we'll talk more about maybe specific projects um, afterwards. I just want to say to Melody, um, we're such big fans of your firm's work that we had our Christmas party in the Serpentine um, restaurant two years oh, ago. That's, one great. Yeah. <laughs> that's great to Thank hear. You. It's a very special project. Now that had a definite sense of you walk in there and you definitely get an emotional lift because, because it's unexpected. You don't expect the play of light through those openings in the roof and the fact that mm -hmm. it changes throughout the day. That's the sort of thing I mean that architecture takes utility to a different level, as well as doing all the other good things about sustainability and repurposing and recycling and all of that stuff, there is at the heart of architecture still some art, I believe. Yeah, and I think especially for that project, it's also um, the fact that it needed to fulfill so many different points in a brief. So it's sometimes yes. a restaurant, sometimes a fashion show, sometimes a talk. And to be able to create a space that can take in all of these or host all of these events and be appropriate for them. Yes. Um, it was, was certainly part appropriate of the challenge. for us. It was very appropriate for us. No one wanted to leave. I think we were all oh, still there nice. at six. We <laughs> had to be thrown out in the end. Brilliant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll over to the to the very first uh, question which is uh, to take a bit of a historical uh, sweep of uh, what's going on um, in the world and uh, I think the the world of work changed drastically around 100 years ago with the advent of the lift and, and structural engineering allowing tall buildings and, and Frank Lloyd Wright's 1939 um, open plan office um, I think that was one of the first offices of such which kind of encouraged the admin efficient administration of paperwork and then we moved on to the kind of the borough landshaft of the 1960s which was all about social interaction and now we're been going undergoing these vast changes in technology the need for engagement and retaining staff um, and now it's about collaboration and creativity um, so to the first obvious question um, of this session which is how is the pandemic changing the world of work and how should architecture respond? Um, so I think um, I'll allow you to kick off uh, first, Sasha, with that, um, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to use the dreaded C word, in fact, three times. So the first one is not the one you'd expect. It's convergence, which is a fundamental aspect of our time. 
And you can illustrate that really, really quickly by looking at one of those. But even my rather antique fossil one has replaced about 15 different things, many of which were buildings, libraries, telephones, cinemas, alarm clocks, notebooks, medical, um, the list is on and on. And one of the other things that's happening in our world, not just work, is the convergence of how we live, work, socially interact. It's not in boxes anymore. It's, you can have typically, again, Shoreditch House. Is it an F and B place or is it a place of work? Well, it's both, depending on what time you go there, but in the same space. And the other one, obviously, is um, I think COVID was invented by the Climate Change Marketing Board to, um, you know, to, to uh, the, the oil companies, that is, in order to distract attention from a real issue that hasn't gone away. It hasn't gone away. So now we've got two, two challenges, which I think will fundamentally alter the nature of buildings. And I just want to bring in and mention, if I can, um, probably the most influential book ever written some including religious books and some would say they were dictated not written depending on your point of view that book is actually on the origin of species by charles darwin and darwin was much misappropriated and used by the nazis to justify all sorts of horrendous things he never said survival of the fittest what he said at the end of the book is and i'm paraphrasing he said it is not the fastest or the strongest animal that will survive but the most adaptable. And that is as true today as when he wrote it. And it's particularly true, not just of creatures, but of buildings, because we have built an awful lot of very unadaptable buildings. And, and Puneet, you, I mean, you probably would agree with this, that we've got loads of buildings that cannot respond to climate change at all. And what do we do with them? And if you look at COVID, for instance, um, look at a building like the Shard. It's beautiful. Love it. But it's very tall, very thin, and it's serviced by how many lifts? I don't know, four, six? All, all serving different functions. Now, if you have to socially distance for the next two or three years in those lifts, you're in big trouble because you cannot get the people up and down the building. So maybe buildings will get wider and flatter. They will get more thermally massive, less glass, less air conditioning, more natural ventilation. All of these things will morph into, into a new set of, of um, parameters, I believe. Um, so I, I think I've said my piece, and, and I also think that adaptable buildings should be such that can easily convert. So one week or one month, it's a, a WeWork type space, then it might become residential, then it might become a socially interactive space. Because the other thing that's, that COVID has done is it's turbocharged online grocery shopping and working remotely. So if anyone had asked me a year ago, could all your office work remotely with all your consultants? I'd have said, absolutely not, no way. And I'm a bit old fashioned perhaps. We like to get in the room with the drawings, the red felt tip pen, the engineer, the m &E, blah, blah, blah. And yet it has worked. The so Barclays, for instance, re relocated all their, all their um, facilities and all their staff in two weeks to work from home and now they're seriously considering why do we need all these big um, office buildings with our name on the top we we actually you know retail banking probably made a big loss but the the trading that all went on and um, highly profitably so that's going to change things um, because if you're not all going into the office how do you do mentoring how do you mentor um, people on a Zoom call? And where do you put your big glossy sign that is the promotes your, your international brand? Where do you put the creche and the free canteen if everyone's working from home? And I think we, we will see different sorts of, of um, what is the function of, of the head office? It's, it's probably more a social space than actually where you do the nuts and bolts work because of the advances in technology. So um, I'll shut up now and hand over to someone else. Well, thank you for that. And uh, that's a very memorable uh, phrase from, uh, from, from Darwin is equally applicable to ac architecture as, as life itself. Um, Hugh, uh, what do you, where do you think we're going from here um, with the pandemic? What's going what's to come next and how should architecture respond? 
I mean, I think in terms of the office, I mean, you could argue how much has the office actually evolved, you know, in the last, you know, 50 years in reality. I mean, the, the, you look at the square mile, you know, the big open floor, like the office that most people go to, um, whether it's in the financial district or wherever else, is, is pretty much, you know, you can look at a film like The Apartment and the, you know, the Billy Wilder film and see, you know, Jack Lemmon in that office space and it's sort of the same. I mean, okay, it, Partitions not there, but there's this kind of a rigidity to it. Um, I think the interesting thing about the pandemic is that it's it's proven a rule that people didn't think was maybe people started to think about these kind of things. I think it's proven a rule across industries that homework and more flexible work is workable, um, that people can be trusted, that things can be done. I think that is interestingly we get counterbalanced by. As time has gone on, um, going back to something Sasha just said, there is um, a simple fact that we're social beings and I think you have to meet, you have to congregate, I think you have to have face-to-face -face communication. I think there's practical issues with an architect's office, uh, as Sasha mentioned, with mentoring, uh, flow of information, and that affects efficiency. You know, you can have somebody stewing at home for two hours uh, over something that could have taken a five minute conversation if they're able to walk across the, across the room and have that chat. So I think the tension, um, the tensions have increased slightly that whilst the tech, we, we know that technology has, is challenging architecture in lots of ways, you know, the, the, the physicality of space uh, and the environment um, in a virtual world, an increasingly virtual world, but I think what the pandemic has shown is that there's a kind of a balance to be struck here that, and it can be more, um, it can be honed um, in, a, in a way that maybe it was, there were polarities, I think. There was the physical space and there was the virtual space. I think now that particularly with relation to work, I wonder whether we are in a time now where people go, well, we can have a bit of both and we try and get both to actually operate to their best um, uh, for different things, I think. Uh, you know, I think the virtual has sort of encroached and has suggested that it could um, replace certain aspects. And I think when, as human beings, biological beings in space and social beings, I, I question whether that is actually, actually the case. Um, so uh, whether the office, um, I mean, obviously you've got these issues now in cities where, you know, particularly, uh, uh, not necessarily London so much, but I think other cities, Bristol, Leeds, I was reading recently, have, have had recent development of you know, business centres in the towns. You know, the, uh, that kind of um, community has dropped off massively through the pandemic. And only a, with only a third of the workforce being able to be back in the building at one time, it does raise the question, what are these spaces used for? Um, so, yeah, I think there's a... It, it's, 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 the pandemic has reignited in a way a, a tension, but I think it's uh, between architects and virtual, but I also think it's given a potential clearer view of how the future could be um, with a balance of both. Um, so I don't think architecture is necessarily um, as under threat. I think it seems to be more necessary in a way, um, but in a really defined, uh, a clear, more clearly defined manner I think, than, than it has been. Uh, Melody, what, what are your views on where we are now and what's going to happen next? Um, I mean, I, in some ways, I agree with a lot of what Sasha and Hugh said, and then I might veer a little bit from that. Um, as individuals, as a, as a society, as companies, we've definitely been thrown into the deep end with this sudden um, finding out that we, we wouldn't be able to travel anywhere, um, for me, almost overnight. And then companies realizing that they actually had the resources to work remotely. Um, we all had the possibility to do it. We just hadn't taken, I think, the initiative to enact it. And um, I think a lot of companies, from what I hear, you know, have adapted really well considering the circumstances. So like Hugh said, we can see what the possibilities in the future are with moving to the cloud, moving to work remotely, collaborating virtually. Um, but what do you think? What do you think the expectations will be from the workplace? What do you think? How do you think people's expectations will change when they do go to the to the research lab or the car plant or the academic institute? What will they be expecting? And how think, how do you think architecture should respond to that? Um, 
I mean, I think, well, those are actually, some of those are the key places that we can't work remotely from. So those are the key places that the labs, the um, spaces for collaboration, the, um, the, I mean, even for myself, the model making, the 3D printing, the materials library, those are the places that I'm going into the office to visit. Um, so it, it, we won't be able to replace those just yet. So they, they will be the kind of anchors, I think, for the office. Um, and then from which to build up this culture again. So on the one hand, it's a social culture because we, um, we, we build up that culture with each other over the years in terms of mentorship, um, the relationships and the communication that we build up with our colleagues, um, which is why I think a big part of the reason why working remotely has transitioned relatively, let's say, well, um, is because many um, teams already have been working together with each other. But how do you make that sustainable for the next 10 years if the same kind of physical interaction isn't always there? I think there's going to be um, maybe a shift in the priorities or the values placed behind um, the design and fitting out of those amenities so that there's um, maybe the space requirements are slightly different and it's less about workstations and it's more about those collaborative shared resources. Um, to be honest, I also think that in a way the office will be um, more, become more of an amenity for people in the future. So not everybody is that fortunate enough to be able to have a good space to work at home, um, whether they have kids or whether there's a kind of lack of space or the kind of increasing challenges in finding nice housing stock in London. Um, the office becomes a place that not only embodies the kind of communication of a company and its brand, but also a place to embody that for its team and for the employees. Thank you, Melody. Um, Puneet, you've done a lot of um, life science um, institutes and you do a lot of higher end institutes. I mean, how much of that in the future do you think will be replaceable for, for, for home working? And then what do you really think is going to happen in, in, in those areas which you specialize in, those sectors you specialize in? Yeah, so, so my thought is I've been thinking a lot about it lately and you know, I keep going is that we as humans are sort of always hungry for collaboration, for interaction. Isolation is not something, at least most of us uh, do not enjoy isolation. And as you can tell with all these extensive Zoom meetings uh, that we have found ourselves interacting in some ways even more than before, but it's not the right mode of interaction. So my feeling is that architecture in a sense is going to continue to evolve to allow for those interactions and collaborations because we've been okay for a few months, but I don't think this model is going to last forever. So that's sort of general collaboration and interaction aspect of our human behavior that we will certainly make an effort to adapt our buildings to support the new paradigm. And then in terms of certain activities, as Melody was saying, uh, like going to the model shop, uh, in the world of science and research, uh, you are really, the scientists are actually working with tools, uh, chemicals, objects. They're always creating something new. They're always inventing. And for that, they need to not only do things uh, with things, but they have to go and meet with other people and work with other people. So I'm thinking that none of those methods are going to change, uh, but we will find ways to accommodate uh, those activities in a slightly different way. Uh, what we are seeing uh, in the United States that a lot of uh, laboratories or science buildings came to a complete halt in the middle of March, uh, but then they continued to do the activities which were related to the scientific enterprise uh, through that process, through that time period. And I feel like uh, as the country is trying to open, those are the areas which are opening first. So science and research is continuing to happen. Certainly you are trying to socially distance, uh, you are creating shifts, but the idea of going into a space and interacting with your environment uh, is still fully there and will continue to exist. 
Okay, before I, I go into... I think there's a lot of... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I just want to jump in because there was something else that Sasha brought up, which was if buildings would become less vertical with the lifts. Um, I mean, the buildings definitely, architecture must be much more flexible. I mean, we've seen that also the impact that we can have by um, curbing our transport across the city. So it's not just changing the shape of our buildings, but this is also changing the shape of our cities. But there's also lots of technologies that can also um, be integrated into architecture. For instance, that start to, um, like there's contact lists, um, there's lots of different sensors that can be used to open doors and control lifts, and they can also sense how many people are moving through. So in the same way that traffic can be kind of um, adjusted with variable speed limits, I'm not saying that you're controlling people that much, but there are ways to kind of streamline this. And the and I think a lot of this can be curbed also with the behavior of people. Because if you look at cities as dense as Hong Kong or as vertical as Hong Kong, they only had four deaths, I think, for a population of 7 million people. And they were in such close vicinity. And that's because they were prepared in terms of how they would um, behave in public spaces. I'm going to, yeah, Sasha, I'm going to, do you want to, respond to that oh, on the point of adaptability because oh, I think that's one of yes, your yes one of my hobby horses um one of the things that's always interesting and I'm afraid as architects we tend to think sometimes that that we shape events or events around making a building sadly we don't you know market forces building regulations planning all sorts of things mainly shape what happens so if you look at what's really happening now in the last couple of years in the office fit out world but we have many connections in London and other cities, but let's look at London. Completely new dynamic. The new dynamic is an intermediary layer of what you might call consolidators. And these are not your, not your normal players. It's not just Regis and people like that. Some of these are banks, big banks. They're going to the landlords and they're saying, we will take a 15 year lease on your building. And we'll sign the, um, the repairing, and maintaining and the covenants and all the rest of it, because that's what we are. We are a covenant. And then they splice and dice and they provide space on very flexible terms to the tenants. And this is all about nimble, adaptable, flexible. And they handle everything. They do the fitting out. So the tenant goes to them and they say, right, what do you want? You want a one month license? You want six months? You want... But the, the more security of tenure you have, you know, the less per foot you pay, but the more tied in you are. And the more flexible you are, the more you pay. But if you're a startup, you're, limited, you're, you're in one month. So the old days, I remember when we first started, you had to sign a 12-year lease and director's personal guarantees and all of this. Just really difficult. And for a, a startup, they can't take those financial commitments. So the, this is now how it's working. It's completely changed the... The, the dynamics of, of, of how the money works, because if you're a fit out contractor, you're not working for the tenant anymore. You're working for these intermediaries. And what are you going to fit out? And who pays when the tenant says, I've changed my mind and I'm leaving? So it's a whole new world. And it's all about flexible, adaptable, nimble, because, it, because people do not want financial exposure of a long lease anymore. I mean, yes, if you're a massive institution, a government institution, British Standard Institute, something like that. Not if you're a small, um, high-tech, internet-focused, digital-focused company, which is, you know, what supposedly the growth in non-manufacturing construction is going to be. So that, I was just interested because, Hugh, you were talking about how office buildings haven't really changed much in the city. But I think how they're being procured, leased, is changing. And actually, it's interesting, if you look at Lloyd's, how did Lloyd's start? Lloyd started as a bunch of men in a coffee house, insuring ships. That's how it started. So they'd go to the coffee house, have a coffee, and say, all right, I'll insure your ship for this much money. That's it. And it's almost going full circle. Soon we might be going back to the pub to do a deal, you know, rather than around the boardroom table. But anyway, um, I'll hand over to someone else. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to... Well, go on, Hugh. I'll let you come in, and then I want to move to the to the second part because otherwise we'll um, yeah. we'll be in the, the, the pandemic. The pandemic will take over the whole uh, take take over the whole show as usual. Yeah, go on. Um, yeah, I was 
the, the question for me out of all that and the transience and the temporary nature of things, I mean, we've seen it in, in the you know, residential living with you know, people renting a lot longer and the, the, the way in which the rental model works and that lack of uh, stability that that creates. There is this inherent tension between when your architecture has an ability to, uh, to challenge typologies, um, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's an office, a house, whatever. Um, and obviously off the back of that, um, you create, maybe you create spaces that are interesting, new, iconic. I mean, if you look at, say, Johnson Wax by Frank Lloyd Wright as an office space, you know, it's church-like, it's highly unusual, and it's celebrated. It's also 90 years, 90 years old, and the world's moved on, and that was a pre-digital uh, pre age. But if you reduce, I think what, what the point I was coming on to about the uh, net letable uh, areas in the city is that it doesn't matter, you come and go, tenants come and go, but the, the architectural opportunities are limited because you're sandwiched between a f two floor plates and one fit out becomes very much similar to another. Um, and what is that, that sort of, to a certain degree, uh, limits what architecture then can do in that space, one could argue, you know, it becomes singular as a response rather than, you know, open. So I'm going to come on to the, the, the second big, that leads me nice on to the second big question of the, of the, of the session really, which is the, the main question really. Um, and that is how can architect uh, culture is really important the productivity and some of the comments are coming in happiness um, engagement so what can our irrespective of the the pandemic and these historical changes we're going, probably going to go through in the way we we work how can architecture um, help create those environments um, happy environments engaged environments how do you build the brand the culture and the identity through architecture what do you each of you do um, in order to shape the performance and the culture of the organization. Um, coming on to you first, Panit. Uh, that's an excellent question because, uh, uh, because I find architecture to be most interesting as a profession because we have a huge responsibility as professionals to define uh, how people behave in some ways, uh, how people react to their surroundings. And what I have found is, uh, and, and I mentioned that in my introduction, my passion for sustainability, but there are many ways people look at sustainability. Of course, there is environmental sustainability to be thinking about the environment and also thinking about the economics. But to me, the most important thing is human health. And what we, when we pack people inside a building or I mean, you're, you're inside uh, all the time, either you're in your workplace or you're at home. And when you're always inside, your environment uh, plays upon your behavior and your culture and so on. So I always try to make sure that every space that you're in is daylight. Uh, very simple principles, daylight affects how we behave, how we react. Uh, views to the outside, always looking at a physical space versus looking at the green. So incorporating those simple elements in your built environment can really enhance how you behave. And how people behave directly impacts the culture of a group of people and in turn the culture of the organization. So, so to me, uh, and I'll keep it brief and come back later, but the idea of focusing on uh, human health that links to human behavior to the culture of the organization that they belong to is the sequence and architecture can very, very uh, strongly influence that, whether it's the way you design a space, uh, the materials you use, the colors you use, or uh, connecting with the environment, uh, all of those play into the sequence of events. Uh, Melody, I mean, you've got you've got um, Zaha Hadi practice is very famous. You know, you you, you know when you've seen a Zaha Hadi building, it, it kind of sticks out. So, do you think um, a practice should lead the culture of the organisation, or do you respond to the culture of the organisation when you're briefing and developing the buildings? Um, I would say. To be very honest, historically, we've probably done both. Um, at the end of the day, it's 
it, it's critical um, to be able to address the grief that the client comes to us with and to do what's um, what they're looking to create with their project and with their investment. But on the other hand, I, I do believe that we have a number, we have a significant amount of experience, both as architects in the industry, and I speak for all, all of us here, um, but also within our practice, uh, we've developed a number of a set of tools that allow us to really test to a very robust and deep level um, a number of different scenarios to really test the design parameters against the final, um, how it's going to be used. You can never really simulate and predict, let's say, how um, the usage of a building or a space will evolve over time. But I think that what we can do is allow for flexibility, allow for uh, variance, allow for many different types of people and groups and preferences to be able to um, find the kind of space that they need, whether it's to focus, whether it's to gather, um, because, and, and it's about really orchestrating, I think, all of these many multifaceted um, variables, which are kind of hard, quantifiable um, things that are needed in the brief, as well as uh, more, let's say, emotional needs, mental health needs, um, kind of societal, um, cultural aspects that, that should be um, really aspired to in a project. Hey, um, Sasha, do you want to come in here? Yes. What, what, I mean, you, you've done you've done the, you know, I came into contact with you because of Shoreditch House, and they've done incredible work in in my view in terms of creating an identity um, and uh, some strong values, and you really get a sense of the culture that they wanted to create in the Shoreditch House, which is which is one of, which is one of your projects. So if you could kind of roll yes. that into your answer. Yes. Um, can I roll that in at the end? You may. I can. Um, I wanted to say three things. One is architecture is a very unique profession. It's one of the reasons I chose to join it. It started when I was 16 carrying buckets of concrete up and down ladders on a building site. Is that it combines, I don't think anything else it does, it combines art, philosophy, engineering, mathematics, law, the ability to use language and communicate, organize meetings. It spreads across so many disciplines and, and educational requirements to hopefully do properly. And um, in a modern age, I think the element of art has increasingly been left out because you have nowadays generative design, you have you know, the ability to download straight into Revit, the facade components, and, and, and that does have some extent, a, a kind of um, can have a, an effect of reducing the, the individual um, artistic input. Um, because it's about money. But I would draw everyone's attention to a fantastic book by a man called Camillo Sitte, spelled S-I-T-T-E, written in the 19th century at the time when town planning was all Beaux-Arts. It was all axial, radial, grand, processional, etc. And he wrote a book called um, Artistic Principles in the Design of Towns. I think. And he looked back at medieval towns and he said the whole thing about them is a, a sense of surprise. When you go into Siena or something, you don't enter in the center of a square, you enter in the corner. And you walk around something and suddenly you see a church there and you think no one's ever seen it like I've seen it. But actually, millions of people have. But it gives the, the person experiencing it this sense. And that is, I think, central to architecture. It's the deus ex machina. You know, we have a machine that can deliver perfectly capably. I mean, we have a, our own generative design you know, we've done a pact with the devil. We've got our own generative design department, which frightens me to death. But um, it can turn out, you know, very good site plans, very efficient, very commercially driven. Is there an element of art in there? Mm, someone else needs to put that in. So that's one thing I would say. And, and that's on top of all the things Punit has been saying about sustainability and, and space and materials and all of that, is, which is all part of the emotional aspect. So now I want to talk about how you um, how you express an organization's ethos. And I'm going to talk about the British Olympic Association first, not Shoreditch House. We did the, um, their headquarters. We did lots of things for them over the years. We've done, we did the temporary athletes arrival terminal at Heathrow. We did the medical facility at the Olympic Park, which helped them win so many medals. We did um, a pop-up, which was called Team GB House. 
and Westfield made available a tall office building that was empty that overlooked the park and they marketed it to all of the Olympic teams and they said right this is where you can have your VIP reception blah de, blah blah and and you pay quite a shed load of money for six months so it, you fit it out run up to the games and you leave one month after the games so um, the British said to Westfield they said oh obviously we have to have the top floor and Westfield said well you need to outbid China China was bidding for the top floor but they said, but hang on, we're the British Olympic Association. And Westfield replied, they said, yeah, we're Australian, mate. So you pay the money or you don't get it. So the British paid the money and they got the top floor. And we were asked to design Team GB House. Now, everyone else in that building looked at it as an airport lounge. They designed beautiful airport lounges. The point about an airport lounge is you're waiting for something. You're going there to wait for a plane. So I thought, that's completely the wrong approach. Why are the sponsors paying all this money to be involved? They're paying the money because they want to meet the winner of the 100 meter sprint. That's why they're paying the money. So what we designed was an amphitheater and like a, a performance space. So we had huge screens relaying live the, the events and it was in the athletes' contracts that once they won something, depending on where the thing was held, obviously it was at Henley or down in down the sailing down on the south coast, they were the property of BOA for like four hours. So immediately after one of the British athletes won the medal, they were on the podium in this space. And that's why all the VIPs and all the sponsors and all the punters, there was also an athletes, friends and family element, all in one space and the journalist, um, the, the press center, so that it had a sense of theater. And it was very popular. It was on the news a lot. And, you know, the Duke and Duchess visited because we tried to identify what was the single most important thing about the BOA. It's the athletes and that tiny margin that goes you from bronze to gold. And that's something they, they did a, a calculation. It was something like 0.001% in some of the, the races in terms of time. That's the difference between being up there on the podium and not. So we wanted to kind of celebrate that. Um, so coming on to Shoreditch uh, and Soho House, we worked a lot with Soho House from almost from the very, very early time when we first did the electric cinema with them. And they only had mm, Babington and Soho House. And I worked quite closely with Nick Jones. Now, of course, it's all much bigger and it's owned by different people or largely, you know, funders, backers. Um, and in a way, they created a style by deliberately not having a style. And that's, that's quite, a, quite a subtle way of going about it. So the original plan was that all the houses would be different, but they would have something in terms of service, how your staff related to you, um, the fact that you could order breakfast in the, at nine o'clock at night, you know, that, that marked them out from other F&B operations. And to be honest, to begin with, it would have seemed a rather bizarre idea because the idea of a club was like the Travelers Club or the RAC, but of course, they were trying to create something very different, but now they've turned into a brand about lifestyle and about, um, so surely specifically when we started 2006, and I met Nick on the roof in the rain, and he said, I want a swimming pool on this roof, I want a big one. I'm sure you can figure out how to keep it up here, which was quite complicated because water's very heavy. And he said, basically, if we can have a good gym in the pool, gym membership is 500 pounds in the city, so I want to offer a club that for £500, you get all of the gym side, you get all the social side of, you know, the bars and the restaurants. And we had a bowling alley and all sorts of things and ping pong and all the rest. And also you can work here for £500 a year. You think, oh, no brainer. In fact, it's been so successful that when you go there now in the day, it is crammed with people sitting on every spare chair or ledge or windowsill with a laptop. And they've actually now opened their own WeWork style workspace on another floor because they thought, hmm, no one's paying very much for this. They're buying two cups of coffee and, and they're sitting here all day. But um, it, it, it was almost an, originally an idiosyncratic approach that, that was individually sort of focused and curated. That's what made the Soho House start. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, Hugh, um, how do you kind of build experience, identity, brand and culture? And, What's your kind of personal house view towards how you build the, the, those 
identities and culture? Um, usually as a kind of a, I think as a slight provocation, I, th I, I think you, you know, architecture can um, do so much in terms of how it makes people feel in a space, how much it makes them feel that they belong in a space, um, how closer to other people and um, that that is um you know your colleagues or other people other users um i've always treated it as a little bit of a um a challenge to try and tease out brief really i i, I think um it's going to be kind of hard not to talk about what you and i are working on at the moment but you know you take a, a company in a certain industry and obviously the building has to operate in the way that they want it to operate but then the rest a lot of the rest of the brief formulation and the kind of the end game of the environment you create is a sort of a sort of and the what else kind of moment, you know. Um, so you want people to stand out in an industry. I think you have to be unlike other players in that industry a little bit architecturally. And I think you can you can do that with with built space. You know, obviously labs have to work practically as workable labs with certain capacities and. Uh, facilities but the associated spaces and the general starting point is well why make a lab like anybody else or why make an office like anybody else's and then you're sort of into that well what's it going to be and then it's for me about mixing things up so you end up with a kind of it's not doesn't really feel like one thing or another it doesn't feel like an office space and um, we've just been doing hours actually in our office I and mean, we had this we had a, a critical screen that's been in storage for two years waiting to be installed and we're now we've just fitted out the office um right at the moment when everybody's saying well and offices aren't required anymore and aren't we all going to carry on working from home and cut our overheads but for us it became um, increasingly important to re, re in a way add another layer of definition to how we present ourselves to the world as an architectural company obviously there's lots of architects out there there's lots of people specializing in different areas um, when you're in um, you know, what is essentially a competitive market, the, the office space for us has to say something beyond what you do, what, what your skill set is in some ways. It has to be about the something else. In Brony Talks, we set those up for precisely the same reason. It was a way of um, exposing parts of our character of who we were as people in a way that the work didn't naturally do it. As Sasha, oh, what, yeah. as Sasha alluded to earlier, there are so many um, outside influences on why a housing block ends up being a housing block in the way housing blocks are. How much scope is there really to push beyond, you know, what a lot of other people are doing, a lot of other good architects are doing, a lot of other architects who are intent on doing good work. And therefore your identity through the built work becomes slightly anonymous. Um, now some would say well, that's exactly where architects should be because that's, you know, the suppression of the ego and providing a service that is um, making the best end solution for an end user. But as, a, as somebody who makes space and also has their own space, um, you're questioning your own identity and how people perceive you. So I think for me, it's mixed messages in a way. The singularity of vision for me has always been a problem. I don't like it as an architectural style. Um, I think it becomes too... Uh, predetermined, I think, to um, imposing on end users often. The history of architecture is full of that at different levels. Can I, can um, I ask you who, who directly, um, um, in terms of, I mean, having worked with you over the last few years now, I think one of your traits is that you're brilliantly uh, designing eclectic experiences. Um, so, would you, how do you, people talk a lot about creating an experience and engaging places to work in and, and I think even Sasha talked about giving those elements of emotional connection and surprise as well and I think you you're very good at doing that through how do you create eclectic work I mean one of my I mean, eclectic when, design when I um I mean obviously you're getting, you go through the university like everybody else but at a certain point I remember very distinctly we're getting Trufo's book um his interviews with Hitchcock and um became very interested in the uh storyboarding of film sequences and it was a way I started to use that very much as a way of breaking the shackles of a of a uh, what I would call the singularity of vision the stylistic traits that a lot of architecture ends up falling into so that you could 
um, go from one space to another space and almost cut them together stylistically. So there was variety, surprise, drama, and it was sort of more those qualities that you're after. So it's, the aesthetics of those for me was never sacrosanct. I mean, I, I think uh, somebody mentioned it earlier about not having a particular style. I mean, to a certain degree, the, the likes of Shoreditch House do this as well. You know, it's, it's almost designed by non-designers. That's the impression it gives. You know, it's got that kind of uh, accessibility and wel welcoming sort of aesthetic that people, there's familiar elements in it, for example. And I think those, the way in which um, Hitchcock does that in film in terms of the familiarity, he shows you something you've seen somewhere before that twists it. And so you're not alienating people by saying, welcome to this new world that is stylistically different from what you've seen. There's kind of new, there's old, there's seen, unseen, and, there's, and you're sort of getting this variety, I think, of experience. And for me, that's, I think, more uh, representative of, so rather than have a, a singular entity as a building in, in a cityscape or a space within a building, it was more sort of building as it as a as almost you experience uh, life generally, uh, you know, variety of spaces. Um, I've kind of got through some of the, the the bigger questions. I want to kind of bring in some of the the uh, the questions which are coming from the the audience. So I'm just going to quick fire these kind of shorter answer uh, pieces now, if you if you don't mind. Um, and um, a question that came in uh, to you, Punit, which was uh, when you're designing these collaborative workspaces, you know, how do you engage, engage the, uh, the users? How do you factor in their feelings in terms of the spaces that they want? Yeah, so, so we do a very extensive uh, engagement with the users of the space before coming to the final outcome. But what's more important is uh, that we go back after the buildings open uh, to get their feedback in terms of how they're reacting, how they're feeling in a space. And, and that certainly continues to evolve and inform our work. Uh, so for example, at Novartis, uh, when we did their project in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, which was a large science building, we actually did a 50,000 square feet prototype laboratory, uh, which had a completely different model from their conventional models that they were using. And we tested it for a year, which became the basis for their new 800,000 square foot building. So we didn't want to necessarily do something that we felt was right, but we wanted to make sure what was suitable uh, and applicable for that group of stakeholders and users. So there's a very experimental process in which uh, uh, how we design these buildings. Thank you. Um, Melody, to you, um, you've got an interest in culture more broadly. Um, and, and how do you think architecture and the interplay with, with the culture, whether it's society or the organization itself and architecture plays out and what, what's your view on that and the definition of culture? Yeah, I think that was actually a question I wanted to pose to everybody on the call is how you define culture. Um, for me personally, something that's quite influenced my view is um, there's a book from the 60s actually called The Hidden Dimension and it's by an author named Edward T. Hall. And he speaks about all, um, from animals to people and how um, there's certain amounts of research that are done in terms of how there's certain averages of how we react, what causes stress, what causes um, kind of an intimacy and like maybe a stronger mental health. Um, but at the end of the day, culture for me is about communication. And this communication isn't necessarily just the explicit verbal communication or this kind of body language, but there's this um, hidden dimension that all of us move within and that influences the ways that we relate to each other. And that's very much uh, informed by a certain kind of background that we all come from um, and those kind of nuances. And I think that if I take that definition of culture as communication, then it becomes something to really try and strive to um, provide in any project because there's, um, there's so many different types of people with types of preferences and to be able to offer that amount of variation so that they can all feel, like you said, that they can belong in a space so that they can work well in a space and that they're comfortable. Um, it means that a lot of these types of um, factors also have to be kind of overlaid and then 
um, provided for when we design a space. So that could be a great grand hall. It could be a small um, kind of space to focus. Um, but to really be aware of all of these intrinsic influences that as human beings, we, we move around through spaces and are affected by. Um, a really basic example, like in some cultures, closing the door is something that's quite um, aggressive or feels quite private, whereas, uh, because people need to have that physical enclosure, whereas in other cultures, like in Japanese culture, the walls are very thin and sound has a very different kind of impact. So this works across, I mean, this is something that's um, about all of the kind of sensory inputs that we take in as we live our lives and as we um, work and as we um, socialize. Um, because I think culture is quite hard to define. So that's the way that I can come up with a definition that encompasses many, many different um, types of activities and implications and how they should inform the spaces that we design and how they can challenge us to design spaces that can be much more inclusive. Thank you, Melody. We've just got a few minutes left, so I'm gonna look for some uh, quick fire responses here. But um, Sasha, um, what do you think people will think when they look back at this period of design and period of architecture? What do you think the, the works and the, that have been created now, what do you think will they think? Can I say one, one quick sentence about culture before I go into that? Um, it's very interesting what Melody was saying. Um, Margaret Thatcher famously said, there's no such thing as society. You know, there's just people for which she was <laughs> soundly pilloried. Um, and I was saying earlier that architecture is one of the few things that, that combines, you know, philosophy with engineering. And now you're asking us to define culture. So a very apt question. And culture must really be about shared things. It's, now, let's say there's someone in Mongolia who I've never met and I don't speak their language, they don't speak mine, yet we still share some things, not 100%, but some things. We look up at the moon or we look up at Venus appearing in the early evening sky. And as humans, we share that. And when you get closer to home, you have more shared. So there is more shared culture in a European context or between architects worldwide or between communists or between Muslims or whatever. And then it focuses and focuses and focuses so that you can be 99% maybe imbued in shared culture. And, and then the other question is, that's humans, but does it also apply to your pet? So if you have a dog that you love very much, are you sharing, you are sharing some things with that animal? Again, not 100%, maybe 5%. So that, it, it, that I think is what culture is. Um, and it's, I suppose it's a, in an international design age, it's quite hard to, to imbue your own very personal culture because it's a worldwide global stage. And one of the things about architecture that I find a bit disturbing is you go to somewhere in you know, six hour flight away and you get off the plane and you're in a space and you think, I could be anywhere. I'm not in specifically, there's nothing Japanese about this or Namibian about this. I'm in just a bland, one size fits all space. And that's a consequence of the way we procure things now and, and, and the enormous power of computing and digital technology, I agree. Um, so do you want to re-present the question? I'll shut yeah, up what, about culture. Yeah, just what, a, couple of, a couple of sentences. What do you think people will think when they look back at the, this period of architecture and workspace design and the buildings we've done and the spaces we've created. I think they'll, they'll look back and, and they will look back rightly at some extraordinarily iconic things and, and I would include Melody lots of Zaha buildings for your firms um, not specifically her personally you know um, the, 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 the Shard, Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank and the, which are amazing objects. Um, might they also look back and say wish you guys had got more of it right um, because you've left us with a load of buildings that don't actually fit their purpose very well. And repurposing is, I think, another huge aspect of where we are now. What we should be doing is repurposing buildings. And a classic is shopping centres, which is something we're working on at the moment. What do you do with them? What do you do with them? Because they've been wiped out by the internet and they're going to be even more wiped out post-COVID. Because you can't, so you can't really get as many people in. So, you know, 
that's a big challenge, how we repurpose, how we do it sustainably, energy efficient, and actually pandemic proof. Because they ain't going to be the only one. You know, there's going to be others. Um, that's, that's it, really. And adaptability. Um, uh, adaptability at the heart of it. Um, Put it, um, with, with life sciences and some of the high ac ac academic issues that you've been working on, where do, what do you think the, I mean, last comment from you, what do you think the, the, f the future holds? Um, I think as, as humans, we are very investigative in our mindset. So I think the future of life sciences or research or science and technology, I mean, the areas that you're involved in, Prashant, I think they'll continue to evolve, continue to exist. We are going to continue to experiment. And uh, interestingly enough, I equate architecture in that equation, in that situation as well. I think architecturally, we will continue to evolve with our buildings and continue to adapt and adjust uh, when things like this pandemic, and it's not the last, I'm sure we'll face other challenges uh, that we will deal with. So uh, in a nutshell, yes, things are going to continue to evolve and adapt both in the world of science and architecture. And Melody, your, your closing thoughts, uh, where we, where, what's gonna happen from here? What are your thoughts from here for the future? I actually keep thinking that this is a, you know, we'll look at back at this. In some sense, it's a, it's a blip. Um, it's maybe on the surface. So a lot of these kind of, um, this focus on creating buildings that are much more responsible to the, to the limited resources that we have, to making them flexible and last much longer than 50 years. Um, the also climate change. These are all things that many people have been caring about for a long time. And, what's happening now is just something that helps to accelerate the kind of uh, general perception or the kind of just maybe it's a tipping point and hopefully it helps um, make, a, make a lot of these practices and these valuables um, much more ubiquitous. Um, it's always going to evolve. I think when you look at the history of the built environment, it's always adapting to also how we live and how we incorporate more and more technologies within our lives. Um, so it's hard for me to say as a future forecast, but um, maybe we should catch up again in 10 years and then we'll look back. I think some, something that's really interesting for me also is the perception of time. And I think that this um, kind of changing our habits and changing the way that we've moved around and maybe not having so much of a regular habit um, also has had me reflect quite a lot on how we perceive time and how it passes and how it's really not so linear, but it, um, we kind of measure it by different cycles that are all very much overlapped. Thank you. Um, Hugh, your, your closing thought on where, for the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think we're, we're 20 years into a, a new century, aren't we? And um, it feels, I think, whilst it's true to say that awareness of a lot of the issues that are going to dominate this century, it still feels uh, has, has gained uh, you know, momentum and traction. Um, but it still feels like we've lived those first 20 years very much with the same mode of thinking as the latter half of the 20th century in lots of ways. Um, you know, I think you know, the, the old modernist adage of form follows function has, has become form follows finance. And I think there is, that's a, a, a challenge to any other value system that architecture may hold, be it poetic, artistic, or otherwise. Um, and equally, in the face of that, I think architects have thought back to try and preserve some sense of themselves. Um, and though that battleground is not really the battleground that needs to be had for, in this century, I think there are bigger issues at first. Obviously, climate change being the, 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 the umbrella one that will dominate everything. And then, but you know, inequality, you know the way we operate as a society, live, work, life, balance, family, you know, all of these kind of things become sort of tied up in ideas of the workplace and what architecture should be. I and mean, just look at our housing production, it's appalling. It's appalling and antiquated. The construction industry is painfully slow in, in, in the UK and backward in terms of its te technology. So there's lots of work to be done, really. And then, you know, I think there is a redefinition of the role of the architects somehow. I wonder whether there's 
whether they have to be less a, an aesthetic design-led professional, more an enabler. Um, we talk often about having to be higher up the food chain in a way and sort of almost making things happen rather than being on free and waiting for those things to be dictated to us. And I think if architects stepped up, I think we are negligent as a profession out there, and that comes from the, you know, the RIBA on down, I believe. It's, um, we haven't really changed the way we operate. You know, we're not defining our, what architecture is and our role within it for ourselves. It's been defined for us, and, and that's dangerous. Uh, and, and damaging, it's, it's proven the case with uh, you know, one of the interesting things just mentioned about permitted development rights, you know, changing of um, offices, shops into residential. You know, we have got the perfect conditions there. Um, it, was, it was a report that, uh, a couple of days ago for 18 square metre flats. You know, slum conditions in the periphery of a lot of cities. So you can see where the, the forces that drive architectural thinking are you know, what dominates. Um, and I think um, there's a battle, there's a battleground that architects have to redefine their roles I think, to, to, in order to have that battle and succeed in it. Thank you. Um, Sasha, last, last quick word to you and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you. I, I, I very much agree with you and I think one of the problems for architects is that we're a bit too low down the food chain. We tend to get involved. I mean, we find we are involved after the planning consultant has been appointed and after one of the big city surveying type firms we're, we're, and lots of decisions have already been made. And yet we are supposedly, and I think it is, it is true that architects have, are the sort of guardians of the soul in some respect, that it's not all about money. That's not why we do this job. And that we, we are thinking about the lives of the people who use our buildings, not just the people who are paying us to do the drawings. And I think that is a very fundamental role going forward for architects is to, to keep the interests of the end user and, and, and of our buildings very firmly in our hearts because, because actually it's them that we're serving. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank you all. Um, you've been absolutely uh, brilliant panelists and I've really enjoyed uh, hearing your insights. Um, I've always found architects and subject of architecture extremely fascinating as you say it covers a huge range of subjects from the built environment to the emotional experience to to engineering and, and art um, so it's an absolutely fascinating subject and as i continue my endeavor to uh to build the um, and uh, the culture of o2h through the, the, the spaces that we're designing i'll definitely be uh taking on board all your your thoughts and, and, and opinions and, and I'm sure the, the conversation will continue. So thank you for, for all the great work that you do in, in shaping the world around us and uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. And for all our other people on the webinar, we're very grateful for your uh, attendance today and your questions and uh, we'll be back in a, in a couple of weeks time um, with, uh, with Sinal Shah who we will be back. So have a great afternoon and, uh, and, and enjoy the sunshine and I'll uh, wish you all a happy evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Take care. Thank you for listening, everybody.